Tonight, as you know, our topic is American Grand Strategy. Uh, we thank the uh, current chairman of our Board of Trustees, Robbie Harris, Captain Harris, for arranging tonight's panel. He couldn't be with us uh, uh, because of a very, very important family uh, event. And, uh, but we're absolutely <laughs> delighted that the panel is here. We thank all three of the gentlemen for, for joining us. As you know from the, the flyer, uh, three dimensions of a possible grand strategy, uh, the hegemonic view, broad control. Uh, I understand it was hard to get to someone to talk about isolationism, so we, we're talking about a limited invol involvement. And then there's a balanced uh, view uh, of how to achieve the goals of American, uh, uh, how to achieve American purposes uh, with, a, with a grand strategy. The uh, chair of our panel will be uh, Captain Peter Swartz, and he'll introduce the other two panelists, but I feel obliged to say that uh, uh, Captain Swartz has had a remarkable uh, career. I should say also he's a graduate of Brown University. He has a master's degree, degree in international relations from Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies and a master of philosophy in political science from Columbia University. His assignments in the Navy were really quite interesting. Um, on several levels, he, he was, uh, uh, first of all, uh, a writer of the maritime strategy for the Navy uh, in I, the early, in the 90s, that was at the time of uh, Secretary Lehman when the 700 ship Navy, I think, was a, a goal. He also was a special assistant to uh, then uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Colin Powell, during the, Powell during the, the Gulf War, uh, and then uh, uh, was a, a NATO as the uh, director of uh, military operations of the American mission uh, during the uh, decline and fall of the Warsaw Pact. So he had a very interesting set of, uh, uh, of events during the military career, and then he's been with the uh, Center for Naval Analysis since 1993, uh, covering a lot of ground, and, uh, uh, but especially uh, working in the strategy area. Well, let me, with that said, uh, with great pleasure, turn the uh, panel in the evening over to Captain Swartz. Hey, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, Frank, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for inviting us to speak with you tonight and for getting us out of the D.C. area for the evening. Um, we're always happy to connect and reconnect with fellow Americans outside the Washington Beltway, and we're most appreciative of Robbie Harrison Dr. Frank Bird for making this possible tonight. It's especially cool to be inside somebody else's beltway for a change. You know? it's, uh, um, we're saddened that Robbie couldn't be with us tonight, uh, but he sends you all his greetings and his respects. And he also deputized me to make a few opening remarks, uh, doubtless to the relief or the consternation of my two colleagues. Um, let me say just a few words about my colleagues, though, before I f begin. Um, you should have all received one of these flyers. Uh, so you already have their brief biographies. Um, let me just say, and this is because uh, this is really a, a tribute to Robbie and the people that he knows uh, and what he's able to do. These are two of the most thoughtful and energetic national security affairs specialists in the country today, with extensive practical experience as well as long track records of publications that routinely receive national and international attention. Uh, they're also, I'm grateful to say, good friends and close colleagues of mine. Uh, and of Robbie's, or at least they have been so far till tonight. Um, our topic tonight is grand strategy. More specifically, as, uh, as Frank Burgess pointed out, American grand strategy. And uh, more specifically still, what should the grand strategy of the United States, our grand strategy, be? Uh, you should know, by way of introduction, that this is a topic that much ink has been spilled over as of late in academia, at think tanks, such as the places that we, uh, we now work, uh, within the armed forces, places that we used to work, uh, within the civilian bureaucracy, among our political leaders, and among many of our would-be political leaders. Uh, there's a large and a growing public literature on the subject, and all of us on this panel have been deeply engaged in parts of that discussion uh, over the past year or two. Um, we've brought along a couple of uh, documents that seek to illuminate some of that uh, 
uh, discussion. And so if any of you are interested in uh, getting into it a little deeper, uh, I can leave these with, uh, with Dr. Bird. And um, we, certainly, of course, we could get you some others or get you some uh, electrons if you, uh, if you were interested. Now, why all this concern? Why, why are all, is everybody at Twitter about grand strategy right now? Well, all kinds of factors. Um, demise of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, rise of China, the 9-11 Al-Qaeda attacks on our country, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, peacetime and combat record of our armed forces, our diplomatic record, the serious economic predicaments of our closest allies in Europe and Japan, the Arab Spring, nuclearization of Iran, which you're all expert in now, I've discovered, uh, our own economic situation, the upcoming U.S. presidential election, the list of these factors goes on and on. The world, it's clear, has changed all around us. And we've changed too, although we're still clearly the world's most important and productive nation, diplomatically, politically, economically, financially, militarily, probably still intellectually. So in view of all that change, what should our grand strategy be? Now, we haven't got all that much time here tonight, so we won't be able to explore all the nooks and crannies of that question. A good thing, because part of it keeps us employed down there doing all of this um, more arcane work. Um, we'll have to leave it to other venues to handle some of those questions. And some of those questions are questions like, well, just what is grand strategy anyway? And what's our grand strategy been in the past? How has it evolved? Uh, have we actually had one? Should we actually have one? Are we any good at having one? All of these are things that people have been thinking and writing about over the past few years. What we're going to do here tonight is distill out of this large and very passionate uh, discussion on the subject three key strands of the current debate and elaborate a bit on each one of them. Um, three recommended alternative grand strategies for our country. Should we have a grand strategy of hegemony? A grand strategy of offshore balancing? A grand strategy of restraint? Almost neo-isolationism? Now, they're not the only strands in play in the current debate, but they're among the most important, and presenting them should give you a sense of the larger debate as well. Leading off and presenting the argument for an American grand strategy of hegemony will be Dr. Dan Whitenick from CNA's Center for Naval Analyses, a Washington area think tank with uh, a global reach. I got to tell you, Dan is one of our country's leading naval strategists. He's an advisor to admirals and generals. He's a noted academic expert on nuclear deterrence, international relations. He's had many civilian teaching jobs, including a stint uh, up the road at, uh, at Towson. Um, we're, we're lucky that we, we have him with us at, uh, at CNA. Um, and he also boasts more sea time on aircraft carriers as a civilian than many of my colleagues in uniform. So we're very grateful that he could be with us tonight. Dan, make your argument. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, very daunting uh, introduction. Um, uh, longing to go back to an aircraft carrier almost. <laughs> um, thanks to Frank Bird, to... Uh, Robbie Harris and to the entire Baltimore Council. Uh, this is my second time uh, visiting here, and I've enjoyed both of my uh, both of my appearances very much. Uh, and I appreciate all of your hospitality. To lay out a strategy of uh, hegemony, or as I'll prefer the word I like to use, which is leadership, um, <laughs> which I think is a much nicer word. Um, if you think about this, the United States really is in a debate right now that we haven't had in 60 years because it was very comfortable. We thought it quite natural to assume a role um, of global leadership. Uh, we've seen a number of books that said what the United States has, did from say 2000 to 2008 or the late 90s to, to 2008 was very much a trying to bend the world to its will and that this was a, a brief period of America reaching uh, beyond itself. And yet, um, during that period, we managed to increase our defense spending to the grand total of somewhere around 5% of our gross national product, as opposed to the entire Cold War when we spent much more as a percentage of our gross national product and populated the world with 
approximately 700 military installations and a half a million soldiers, airmen, and Navy personnel scattered around the planet, uh, in addition to thousands of nuclear weapons. Yet somehow the last 10 or 12 years was all about reaching for hegemony. Yeah. Um, the world we face now, and as Peter Rose right, as he went through his laundry list of challenges, has basically been characterized by, um, I will say, three things. And that is, what, what's driving conflicts? Is it state on state battles? Are these the old nations that fought each other over and over again? We've seen a rapid decrease of that, but we've seen a significant number of conflicts driven by religion, by identity politics, nationalism, the destruction of states, and we don't need to go through the catalog here. But what happens is that in a world like that, we have meaningless borders, never-ending conflicts that drag on for 10, 20, 25 years, and they create enormous spillover effects in the regions of the world that we find important and that our allies live in. And there's a pressure on the United States as the world looks to its global leader for an entire two or three generations and says, solve this problem, do something. And it looks to the United States to say, prevent disruptions to this global system. And we look at the world system, we look at our trade and we look at our role in the world and our culture and uh, the fact that I can get on a plane and fly and land somewhere and get into a meeting with somebody else and they have the same technology that I do, and we all put this on the table, and we smile politely, and we go back to our airport, and we go to our restaurant, and we finish our meeting, and we pick up our lives, and we think that's wonderful, and we want that stability. We want the world to function like that. Well, that has a cost. The result has been of that world that we've wound up in a bunch of wars we never envisioned fighting. Now, people will say, we could do another strategy. We could turn away from the planet, and spend our time fixing what's wrong at home, which is a wor worthwhile goal. Um, that doesn't seem to work out. We thought that was a good idea after World War II. We left Europe very quickly, only to turn around and go back, 1947, 1948, 1949, and we looked up and said, this isn't how it was supposed to turn out. Korea, 19 that wasn't how it was supposed to work out. And we spent the first six months of Korea chasing our tails, running around, trying to find out how we could get in such a state. Well, it was easy. Walked away, drew a line, said that's not a problem. Well, it was a problem again, because it was a problem to our allies and to our concept of what stability in Asia looked like. So we have spent time in the last years fighting wars for longer periods of time than we thought, and doing not only just global policing, but fighting wars at the same time. And that's difficult, it's hard. So what are the issues we face going forward? We face two of them. One is internal, one is external. The internal one was laid out is obvious to everybody in this room. There's a sign on the Treasury Department that says, empty. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have any more, we spent it all. Okay. The costs are enormous of maintaining your position to lead this democratic group of states that ranges from policing Libya, where we played a supporting role, to Afghanistan, where we play a leading role, to Asia, where we play a stabilizing role. And to have that global reach requires a significant investment of time, energy, and money, frankly. Do we walk away from that? What role do we play if we say it's too expensive and I don't want to do it anymore? because the cost of instability are proven. The cost of walking away from it have been demonstrated again and again and again, and we're terrible at predicting the wars. Ah, the next war will be just like the last war in Korea. No, it's Vietnam. Ah, the next war will be counterinsurgency. Let's do that again. No, that didn't win. Desert storm, that. Ah, this one will be fast. We'll go quick, we'll go easy, we'll win it. No, it takes 10 years. What's the next one like? Where is the next one? I don't have a crystal ball. Maintaining this edge of leadership, of military capability, of diplomatic leadership is costly. So can I get decisive victories in the future in a world that I characterize by identity politics and meaningless borders and endless conflict? That's the tough answer, for us at least. 
The second, option, the second problem looking forward is externally driven. And that is, do these policies work? How do other countries react? Number one, how do our allies react? The theory is if we step back, they'll do more. Europe's more broke than we are. Japan is more broke than we are because their population is aging faster than our population and they're spending more domestically than we are. Do we have a large number of other allies who are going to step up and play the role as a group that we play in the world? I don't think so. Number two, what, an, what is another country going to do? Who is our challenger? This works as a pretty good strategy if you step back from the world and nobody else jumps in and decides to do something. In 1913, the British thought it was an excellent policy to remain offshore, sign a treaty with France, because as long as that treaty is there, they'll know we mean business. It'll work perfectly right up until the Germans march through Belgium. <laughs> when you have to mobilize an entire army and quickly shove it across the English Channel only to be slaughtered in the trenches of World War I because you didn't prepare for that war, because you had a different idea. It works marvelously if you're the Dutch right up until the point that Napoleon decides, I need to march into the Netherlands. It works tremendously well for countries right up to the point where it doesn't work. <laughs> The third part is, what do I do about the current bad guys if I step back? If I step away, do you think that they're attacking us because we're there? They were attacking us before we were there. They were blowing up embassies in the 1990s before Operation Enduring Freedom, before Operation Iraqi Freedom. They were blowing up our embassies in Beirut in the 1980s. They were storming them in the 1970s. How do you propose to handle that? Are they going to step back and say, no, we really didn't mean it. As long as you go home, everything will be OK. I don't think the Middle East works that way. I don't think the Arab Spring is a harbinger of nice, beautiful cherry blossoms. I think it's a harbinger of rule of the street, where the Muslim Brotherhood puts Mubarak on trial, and where eventually they storm and kill Gaddafi, and then they'll wind up storming and killing Assad. And guess what? How do you want to deal with that Middle East? Does it look better than the previous Middle East? Maybe, maybe not. But you have to hedge against it. Faced with that future, what do we choose to do for active leadership? We're intricately linked to this global system. Our political imperatives, our role as a leader of the free world, Every media and political pressure that you can put on our leaders tells them to do something when the world goes wrong. Just because we don't want to do this anymore doesn't mean we can't. The bad guys get a vote. They will keep doing things, and we have to react. If you want to shift to East Asia, is there anybody else who's going to take off against China? You may not think this is what you're facing in the next five years, but it may be what you're facing in 10 or 15 years. And the two gentlemen sitting next to me, with all their experience and expertise, will tell you that 10 or 15 years is not a long time to rebuild a force that's spent 10 years fighting, to get weapons programs going, to get systems in place, to get bases in place, and get access in place. It's a hard game to play, to build an entire security infrastructure. It took us a generation to do it in Europe at the height of the Cold War, spending like crazy to integrate those countries into a cohesive NATO force. So what is our focus in this world? What strategy do we put forward? We take a look and we say, I want to deter in Asia. I want to counter terror, radical Islamic terrorism. And I want to do stabilization missions as required. When countries go wrong in places that countries depend. To the Europeans, North Africa is homeland defense, just like 9-11 was homeland defense to us. If they look up and see a million refugees crossing the Mediterranean, they think that's a national security crisis. That's why they went to Libya. That's why they asked for help. When they look at Syria, they see the same thing in spades. So what military do you build to support this strategy? 
I'll leave you with these four points. Um, you maintain a credible intervention force, which requires we're gonna to have to maintain an Army and Marine Corps that can do what they've been doing for the last decade. I'm sorry, that's just it. We can't steal from this branch to pay this branch to do something new and wonderful. We have to use a whole of government approach on this as well, because this is not just the Army and the Marines going to fight. It requires all elements of the government to figure out that they have a role to play. We economize our deterrent forces. Nuclear and conventional deterrent forces, the big strike, you can save here and there and that. We can make some changes and I think maintain a credible deterrent far into the future. We are going to have to maintain President Obama's greatest reelection strategy, SEAL Team 6, um, <laughs> to maintain the counterterrorism roles that they have done. There's no way around it. We continue our leadership of our democratic alliances, NATO and in the Pacific, because there's nobody else situated where we are who can play that role. Out of those things, that requires a great deal of leadership by our military and by our civilian leadership in maintaining our position, maintaining our stance in those organizations, our leadership roles, requires an understanding on the part of the American people that that's the job we have to play because there's nobody else to play it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan, for presenting to us the argument for U.S. Uh, hegemony or leadership, as Dan would have it, as the preferred national U.S. grand strategy. Uh, our next panelist is Brian McGrath. Uh, Brian is going to present the argument for an American grand strategy of offshore balancing. Uh, Brian relatively recently retired from the U.S. Navy after a truly distinguished career. You know, I mean, you usually say that somebody, when they retired, they had a distinguished career. Um, Brian's truly was that. Uh, Brian was a superb officer at sea. He was a famous destroyer skipper. Um, he was, he did the thing that Navy officers pride themselves at doing, and he did it exceedingly well. And in addition, he held several important positions in the Pentagon. During his final tour of duty before he retired, he was the principal author of what is the current maritime strategy of the United States and its sea services, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard. Uh, entitled The Cooperative Strategy for 21st Century Sea Power. He currently heads Delex Consulting, um, known for its expertise uh, in strategy and strategic planning. He's got a BA in history from the University of Virginia, a master's degree in poli-sci, political science from Catholic University uh, of America, and he's also a graduate of the Naval War College. Brian, offshore balancing. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, I look across this room of 250 people in this beautiful view of uh, the Inner Harbor, and I, I'm thinking to myself, I, I pray that I never become so jaded that I don't realize what a great gift this is, that you have all given up uh, an hour or two of your Monday night to come and listen to me. Um, uh, I will hopefully try to make your investment uh, worth it. Um, thank you, Dr. Bird, and, and to Robbie, obviously, for um, inviting me to be part of the, what is shaping up to be a, a interesting panel uh, based on our primacist friend here. Um, I'm called upon to talk to you about offshore balancing tonight. Um, in doing so, I'll draw heavily upon the writing and thinking of some names that might be familiar to you, including John Mearsheimer, Christopher Lane, Stephen Walt, and a fellow over at uh, Cato Institute named Chris Preble. Uh, my approach will be to briefly define offshore balancing and lay out some of its central tenets, um, focusing on how offshore balancers differentiate themselves from uh, the other uh, major strategies. Uh, because I'm a consultant, uh, I will also try to explain the other view, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what some of the um, uh, regrets are with an offshore balancing strategy. Um, as far as grand strategies go, offshore balancing is a pretty good one. 
Um, I've been personally interested in it uh, since I first heard about it about 10 years ago. Uh, and every now and then, I, I, I really considered embracing it fully and saying, this is the one we ought to have. But then I always pull back a little bit, and I'll explain to you why that is later. Um, but first, some of you may be asking, what is it? So I'll try to, uh, I'll try to explain it using John Mearsheimer's ideas from the University of Chicago. Um, according to Mearsheimer, offshore balancing is a strategy predicated on the belief that there are three regions of the world of strategic importance to the United States. Europe, Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf. Uh, and it postulates that the United States' principal goal is to make sure that no one country dominates those areas in the way that we dominate our hemisphere. <laughs> in doing so, uh, we ensure that um, no rival is, is freed of concerns. We work with friends and allies in uh, offshore balancing to keep these other powers occupied. Uh, because if they were to become as powerful in their own hemisphere as we are in ours, they might someday begin to look uh, with uh, jealousy upon our position. Um, we accomplish this by, as I said, relying on friends and allies, uh, local powers to counter those aspiring he regional hegemons. And, and we keep military forces in the region and available. Um, by this, we mean primarily at sea, um, certainly not garrisoned on land, uh, and not necessarily in the face, you know, right up in the face of other, uh, other powers. Uh, offshore balancers believe that military power should be committed only in the event that a favorable regional balance, one that w works to our advantage, is in danger of becoming tipped. And we roll in and, and we try to untip it or tip it back to our, uh, in our um, direction. Um, John Mearsheimer and his uh, colleague at University of Chicago, or, or maybe he's at Harvard now, Stephen Walt, um, Harvard, believe that offshore balancing is America's traditional grand strategy. It's the, what we've done for most of our time as a country. Um, there is another uh, grand strategy uh, alternative called selective engagement that some people confuse with offshore balancing, and sometimes offshore balancers become selective engagers. Um, selective engagers are one notch higher on the primacy scale. Um, they're, they're okay with garrisoned troops overseas. They're okay with strong naval force um, arrayed where everyone can see it. Offshore balancers are very much in favor of forward deployed naval forces, but doing fewer things. Um, being a little bit further from, from the shore, hence the term offshore. Um, Christopher Lane has identified four, uh, excuse me, a set of strategic principles that he believes offshore balancing uh, are underpinned by and with which he believes most scholars agree. Um, first, uh, that the strategic and economic, that, that the current strategic and economic constraints, um, fiscal and economic constraints, require the U.S. to set strategic priorities. Specifically, the U.S should downsize its forces in Europe and the Middle East and increase its military power in East Asia. Second, America's comparative strategic advantage rests with naval and air power, uh, not on sending land armies to fight ground wars in Eurasia. For those of you keeping score at home, that means Mahan is up, Mackinder is down. Um, third, Offshore balancers believe in burden shifting rather than burden sharing. Um, they want other states to do more for their own security and the U.S. to do less. Fourth, that in reducing its geopolitical and military footprint on the ground in the Middle East, the U.S. can reduce the incidence of Islamic fundamentalist terrorism directed against it. Uh, finally, that the U.S. should avoid future large-scale nation-building efforts, like the ones in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that the U.S. should refrain from fighting wars for the purpose of causing regime change. 
Offshore balancing has generated a lot of buzz in the strategy community lately, primarily, I think, because of a perception of America's decline uh, by some observers. Given our economic state uh, and the fact that, in the opinion of those who believe this, we, we just ain't the superpower we used to be, um, a strategy that forces leadership to make tough choices while husbanding resources naturally has found favor. Additionally, some, including Professor Lane, see that in our recently announced uh, defense strategic framework, a turn to offshore balancing at the highest levels. To include cuts in force levels of the Army and Marines, a renewed emphasis on naval and air power, and a pivot to East Asia, while urging our friends in Europe to take on more responsibility for their own defense. I happen to disagree with the perception that this new strategy is an offshore balancing strategy. I see it more as a selective engagement strategy, uh, especially when I think about some of the things we'll be doing with naval forces in the years to come, including some ships uh, forward deployed in Singapore and some amphibious capability in uh, Darwin, Australia. But to summarize, offshore balancers believe that our friends and allies are free riders they don't spend enough on their own uh, defense. Offshore balancers believe that we spend too much on defense and that what we do spend is misallocated on large land power and land armies designed to fight wars of choice. They are, generally speaking, offshore balancers, proponents of naval power, and they believe the Navy and the Marine Corps should be privileged in upcoming budget battles. So let's see, big on the Navy, Allies got to pay more, more of their own share, fewer wars of choice. Hey, what's not to like? Um, I have a couple of reservations. Um, the first, I have this nag nagging sense that when you scratch an offshore balancer, you find someone who truly believes the United States is in decline. Um, offshore balancing is a wonderful way, in their opinion, to manage that de decline. This is the make it last while we can approach uh, to grand strategy. Uh, it makes me think we've already relegated ourselves to second place, and I'm not ready to concede that yet. Second, offshore balancers focus on burden shifting rather than what we like to do right now, which is burden sharing. As a former naval officer, I'm thrilled with a grand strategy that puts so much em emphasis on naval power. But as a strategist, I worry about the message we send to friends and allies around the world when we pack up and shut down forward deployed land power uh, and then follow up with exhortations that they need to step up and do more. I think this works better in theory than in practice. Um, what if instead of stepping up, they just cut deals with the, with the aspiring regional hegemon, what some refer to as the Finlandization of regions? What then? Uh, how would we promote and protect favorable balances then? Um, will forward deployed naval power be enough to assure allies and deter bad guys? Just forward deployed naval power. I don't know. Um, third, offshore balancing as a term of art is so broadly defined or ill-defined as to permit what I consider to be dramatically different strategic approaches um, uh, to, to each claim the term. Peter will talk to us in a few minutes uh, about a, an approach um, uh, put forward by a, a fellow named Chris Preble at the Cato Institute. Chris Preble is an offshore balancer. There's no question about it. Um, but it's kind of a neo-isolationist offshore balancing. Um, the recently retired Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Gary Roughhead, had a very different view of offshore balancing, one in which naval power was very, very uh, powerfully arrayed in the places where it needed to be, um, but operating daily with friends and allies, doing nation-building things, all sorts of, of peacetime engagement activities. In fact, to the extent that there was any burden shifting in Admiral Ruffhead's view of, um, of uh, offshore balancing, it was burden shifting from American land power to American sea power, not from any of our allies uh, to us. Um, in closing, offshore balancing is a strategy that suggests that allies should do more. 
to maintain their own security interests, that we can and should look after our interests around the world, primarily with naval power uh, and air, air power to some extent, and that the expense associated with primacy represents tremendous opportunity cost elsewhere in our economy. Um, I think that's the end of my allotted time, so I'll stop there and wait patiently for your insightful questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Okay, my turn. I'm here to argue for an American grand strategy of restraint, even neo-isolationism. Now, full disclosure, this isn't normally my beat. It's actually the well-argued position of our good friend and brilliant colleague, Dr. Chris Preble, who Brian has already mentioned, a former U.S. Navy officer, who now hangs his hat at the Cato Institute in Washington, which is probably the preeminent libertarian policy think tank in the country. Um, Chris sends you his regrets. He wanted to be here in person, but just couldn't make his schedule work. But he's coached me on the broad outline and some fine points of his argument, and I'm going to give it my best shot. First of all, many would characterize Chris's preferred grand strategy as being one of neo-isolationism. But Chris would characterize his position as advocating a grand strategy of restraint. Now, what's this terminological wrangling all about? Well, as Brian's already alluded uh, to, isolationism is, in many circles, a very loaded and charged word by now in the vocabulary. It smacks of Charles Lindbergh and others trying to keep Franklin Roosevelt and the United States out of World War II. Um, but restraint is also a term that's been adopted by some of Brian's offshore balancers, um, whom I regard as being more interventionist and more forward-leaning than Chris and his colleagues at Cato. Chris wraps himself in the label of restraint, but restraint has many interpretations in the literature, and his version is very isolationist-friendly, in my view. What also differentiates Chris's position from that of true isolationists is his dedication to free trade, remember he's a libertarian, and his openness to continued immigration to the United States as engines of American economic growth and wealth creation. So I've coined a term, it's just mine, which is the heavy restraint guys, the heavy restrainers. Um, and uh, what they mostly advocate uh, and others would just call them neo-isolationists, is pretty much staying home. Stay strong at home, to be sure, and that makes them different from unilateral disarmers, but stay home. They recognize that the United States is a great power with extensive global interests, but they see those interests as being largely commercial, and they see them as being best defended by bringing the forward military forces, so beloved of the vast variety of hegemonists and leadership and offshore balance guys, bringing them home and urging our friends and allies to take a much more active and robust role in the balance of power in the regions in which they live. Chris and his colleagues at Cato take a very strict and narrow view of what should constitute national defense. They see our strong forward stance in Europe and in Asia and the Middle East and elsewhere as a gross and untoward drain on our national treasure. It encourages the very worst habits of our forward friends and allies to free ride on our presence, and it keeps their own defense budgets low. Wealthy NATO nations, Japan, South Korea, the Middle East oil kingdoms, they should be footing the whole bill for their own defense, not hiding behind America's bulky taxpayer-funded skirts. Peacetime U.S. military forward presence is viewed by Chris and his colleagues at Cato and others, it's not just at Cato, as unjustified, provocative, meddlesome, unnecessary, leading only to a bloated U.S. military posture and to dangerous temptations of U.S. overseas meddling and adventurism. Counterinsurgency in particular is seen as an unduly costly effort at nation building it often results in failure, and even worse, it creates threats to us where none existed before. Their answer to terrorism is better intelligence, surveillance, policing, special forces, not forward-deployed conventional military forces, and certainly not ground wars such as those in Iraq and Afghanistan. They see these wars as breeding threats to our country, not forestalling them. 
The heavy restrainers, neo-isolationists, are firm believers in strategic nuclear deterrence. They'd spend a lot of money and continue to invest in the strategic nuclear deterrent because they see that as effective in minimizing the chances of attacks on nuclear armed states, including us. They also see America's economic strength and adaptability as a sine qua non for America's national security and military strength. And they emphasize the great benefits that America reaps as an island nation sheltered behind two great oceans. They see these oceans as containing moats to defend ourselves, not as theaters giving us maneuver room or highways to enable us to project our power forward to aid others. They decry most American interventions overseas, which they see as generating terrorism, embroiling us in costly and unnecessary foreign wars, which accrue few benefits to the country. Their bottom line is that there's simply no region of the world outside North America and its Caribbean, Atlantic, and Pacific approaches that's important enough to justify expending American blood and treasure in the name of American national security. Moreover, they see the current effort to wring efficiency out of the Pentagon practices um, and try to get the Pentagon to shape up and do a better job uh, in the way it manages itself as a fool's errand. The problem they see is not how the military is managed, but the proliferation of military objectives. Cutting way back on these objectives is the only sure way to rein in Pentagon spending. Meanwhile, they maintain that they are not advocates of U.S. disarmament, only in reductions in our vast forward array of combat forces and defense infrastructure. They say they want a strong Navy, too, but one that operates routinely from and near Guam and Honolulu and San Diego and Norfolk, not in the Persian Gulf or the China Seas. And they decry most peacetime offshore options, beloved of Admiral Ruffhead and others, as being too forward-leaning. The only offshore option they would countenance is one that puts any U.S. offshore forces all the way back off American shores, not forward off the shores of Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. They'd retain robust capabilities at home, and in particular, they'd continue a strong program of research and development so that we'd have cutting-edge forces. In fact, between the unilateral disarmers and the offshore balancers, they see themselves as occupying a reasonable middle ground. They are certainly unpersuaded by arguments that globalization demands a strong U.S. posture forward and on the high seas. They don't see very much threat at all to world trade or to American imports and exports. They believe that any potential trade disruptions will be small. The markets will usually adjust to them quickly. They're libertarians. They believe fanatically in free markets. Uh, they see a pro uh, without government intervention in those markets, including military interventions. They see a prosperous and innovative U.S. domestic economy supporting a capable military that develops and hones its uh, fighting edge at home as the very best U.S. hedge against an uncertain economic and national security future. And implicitly, they see our national leaders as having adequate powers of discernment, able to correctly figure out where to go and what to do if a crisis breaks out that demands our forces to surge forward, without already being forward, ready and familiar with conditions in the theater. They also implicitly, I think, see these crises as unfolding slowly, which gives you time for the forces in the United States to deploy from American shores, to be ready on arrival rather than already being in theater and ready when the crisis begins. In closing, let me read to you some direct quotes from Ben Friedman and Chris Preble's monograph, Refocusing U.S. Defense Strategy. I quote, these days, policymakers want the U.S. military to contain China, transform failed states into stable democracies, chase terrorists, train various foreign militaries to chase terrorists, protect sea lanes, keep oil cheap, democratize the Middle East, protect European, Asian, and Middle Eastern states from aggression, spread goodwill through humanitarian missions, respond to natural, national disasters, natural disasters at home and abroad, secure cyberspace, and much more. 
For the supporters of such missions, <laughs> the military forces and budget needed to pursue these goals can never be enough. Defining the requirements of our defense so broadly, this is, I'm quoting again, is counterproductive. Our global military activism wastes resources, drags us into others' conflicts, provokes animosity, drives rivals to arm, and encourages weapons proliferation. I guess in passing, I have to say, I'm not sure I understand why they take umbrage with a term that was uh, thrown at Charles Lindbergh. That was exactly the argument Lindbergh made as to why we shouldn't get into World War II. We can save great sums and improve national security by narrowing our goals and adopting an actual defensive posture in the world. The United States confuses what it wants from its military, which is primacy or hegemony or leadership, with what it needs, which is safety. Our leaders exaggerate the capability of the enemies we have and invent new enemies by defining traditional foreign troubles, geopolitical competition among states, instability within them, for example, as pressing threats to our security. Geography, wealth, and nuclear weapons provide us with safety that our ancestors would envy. Our hyperactive military policies damage it by encouraging rivalry and resentment. Global military primacy to the believers in uh, neo-isolationism and restraint is a game not worth the candle. End of quote. Okay. Um, I've said my piece. Uh, it's time, I think, for us to mix it up a bit uh, and then open things up to you folks in the audience. Uh, Dan, any comments? Um, <clears throat> well, <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take on one, one comment that uh, was at Peter's um, presentation and then one that, that Brian raised that I think are worthy of discussion. Um, that is the, uh, the question of regional conflicts and not being a very big threat that, that Peter mentioned a, a minute ago. Um, that they don't pose that big a threat to world trade, that they're slow to evolve, that we have time to deal with this if we're all based back here in the United States and we can surge over there and uh, solve the problem uh, like in World War II. Um, in an age where the war might be over in the first few days, depending on how long you can get your missiles flying and how quick your short range Missile, I'm not talking about nuclear, just, let's, we'll just take conventional missiles that are going to get there a lot faster than we're going to surge from the United States, um, are going to play an enormous role that are going to really affect what happens in the world. The modern technology of cyber attack, denying somebody their space capabilities, their communications globally, um, the disruption to uh, regional stability not affecting us, uh, we get 20% of our oil from the Gulf of Guinea. Everybody feeling good about the stability of the Gulf of Guinea these days. <laughs> For those of you, it's Nigeria, Benin, Ghana, places like that, Cameroon. Um, that won't impact us at all, I'm sure. Uh, it took a 3% cut in global supply of oil in 1979 to create the crisis that we dealt with for the next three years and the economic ramifications of that. 3% cut in the supply of oil in the globe, okay? Uh, think about where that might land you when people are exploring for oil in the South China Sea, West Africa, Middle East, places like that. Um, so those conflicts have a tremendous capability to disrupt trade, disrupt what we think of as the secure, normal, stable operations that we have. Also, our ancestors uh, may not envy us in the sense of the fact that our, their, their economy was about almost 100% based on this country and farming, things like that. We are the world's leading trading power today. If you think about our impact financially, imports and exports, we play an enormous role in the world economic system. So I think that argument bears some discussion. Um, the second thing that comes up is the one that Brian raised about 
I think was interesting, uh, quoting Mearsheimer, uh, for most of our history, we've been an offshore balancing power. Um, to say the least, John Mearsheimer is a well-known and famous political scientist. Um, I don't know uh, how we can discuss current political science without a really good understanding of history in the sense that one could argue that for most of our history, we didn't have a choice as to what we wanted to be. Uh, we existed as a very weak power at first, existing behind a wonderful splendid isolation provided by the British Navy, um, which patrolled the Atlantic and kept it wonderfully peaceful for our ships, unless, of course, they wanted to stop them and you know, impress a few sailors. And I believe this town has a, some experience with that. Um, <laughs> I'm looking out at a fort, I think, in the dark. Um, and then we embarked after the Civil War in a wonderful period of isolation where we said, let's rebuild the country, build some railroads and stuff like that, move west. That was great. Uh, then we took part in, I believe, two world wars, World War I and World War I Part II. Um, that took up 30 years, 30 or 40 years of the first part of the last century. And since then, after the end of those wars, when we were the unchallenged nuclear superpower of the world and had military global reach with naval, sea, and people based on land, we weren't offshore balancing. We had 300,000 people on the front line in Germany. That's not an offshore balance. Offshore balancing would have been Conrad Danauer following his advice when he said, how about if you put one American on the border? We'll make sure he's killed in the first day. He thought that would commit the United States. We thought it took a little bit more to deter the war that we didn't want to have start. History shows that uh, offshore balancing does a wonderful job of fighting a war. The Royal Navy won a number of battles for the British from 1588 right up through the Napoleonic era. That's a pretty good record. It does a terrible job preventing war because people don't believe your deterrence is credible. If you're not there, if you don't have any, what is that, you know, it's not worth the candle? If you don't have any coins on the table, people don't believe you're playing the game. They call your bluff. I don't think the world going forward has got anybody but the United States who's willing to stand up and have the bluff called, because everybody else folds. I'd like to thank Peter for throwing a softball that I can take a big swing at. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the concept of restraint is, is, flows through offshore balancing all the way from the neo-isolationists to the, to the uh, near-selective engagers. Um, for some reason, these very bright people believe that our political figures have become invested with the power to see the future. That they, are, that they somehow have acquired what I refer to as discernment. Um, and <clears throat> that, that you can then um, keep your forces home, like, or, or you know, in the San Diego op area or the Vay Capes op area, like Preble would have us do it. And then if, if you saw something developing, you would know when to commit your forces to change that balance. My view is this. Um, in such an approach, two things would happen. Either A, you would reach your decision to commit so late that the cost of the doing isn't worth it, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, and you then don't do something that you should have done. Or you wait so long to make the decision that the cost in blood and treasure is always higher than it would have been if more closely forward deployed forces had dealt with the issue more quickly. Now, Preble would tell you, well, they shouldn't be dealing with those issues. That's, it's a, there is a bit of a circular argument uh, to it. You know, the, I, I, I've had poking, you know, chest poking sessions with Chris Pearl before where we, and you know, I'd say, dude, we're, you know, it's going to be bloody. It's, it's going to be, you know, there are going to be security balances that will arise that are not in our favor and we're going to have to go and we're going to fight. He goes, and his thing is, well, we just won't, it's just not our fight. We'll just stay out of it. 
And I think um, what neo-isolationist offshore balancers do is give us a nice roadmap to true isolation. It's a way station on the way to something else. It's not a viable, um, it's not a viable grand strategy. It's a, it's a step towards isolation. So there. <laughs> I'm not Chris Preble. But if I were Chris Preble, say, so, you know, we spent, I don't know, the, much of the 19th century thinking about Cuba we, we saw the Spanish-American War coming decades before the war. World War I, I mean, they were doing it for three years before we ever got involved in it. World War II, I mean, it was pretty hard not to see what was going on uh, in, in Europe and in Asia. Um, Korea was a bolt out of the blue, but Vietnam built and built and built and built. And problems in the Middle East have festered and so on and take a while uh, to finally blow off. You can often see these things coming. You can often get ready for them. You don't need to be there contributing to the very factors that make them blown off. I think that that would be uh, Chris's point. Um, so you've heard us talk about the uh, famous, uh, but can not- I, Can I interrupt you? We really do like Chris Preble. He's a good friend of ours. <laughs> he's a, he, and he's a very smart man. I don't know. But he wishes we would stay home. Um, um, OK, well, we've given you a smorgasbord, a range of things. These are, these are real things that real people are fighting over uh, today inside the other beltway. Um, you're members of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Uh, what do you think? If I understand the question correctly, it's what's in grand strategy for the average American? Um, there's a global system at play right now, a global system um, that we made the rules for, that we created out of the rubble of World War II, and that works disproportionately to our advantage economically. Um, the American public um, benefits handsomely from a system we still run. Uh, I believe, I mean, I, I was here pretending to be an offshore balancer tonight, but I'm really not, kind of a primacist. Uh, I, believe, I believe that the, Ameri the, the average American, ha you, you're going to go home and make some food tonight, you're going to drive a car, you're going to drive home in an American car. Okay, if you, dro if you drove, many of the people drove, drive, drove here, some of them may have a BMW that's made in South Carolina. They may have an American car that's 70% made of materials from overseas. Um, it is a globally interconnected world we live in, but we still primarily make the rules. That is something that works to our benefit. When we don't make the rules anymore, I think we will, we will suffer and average Americans will suffer. There's no way that we can come to grips with this adequately in a short period of time, but I, I've been amazed at how much ground was covered and how nice the discussion was and how very helpful it was to all of us. So we certainly thank you very much, General, for a wonderful time.